a lot of people viewing us from different countries india egypt philippines germany romania bulgaria mexico serbia the whole of the middle east including saudi arabia iraq uh, australia hi dr jasen from germany myanmar vietnam pakistan Dr. Shetty, welcome. I'm glad to have you here. So, uh, yeah, without any further delay, let's uh, begin uh, today's webinar. Let me introduce you to the speaker. Uh, you can see him. He's on the left side of the screen. That's Dr. Paolo Manzano. Um, so what can I say about him? He was a great mentor to me, and uh, uh, he was uh, one of my clinical uh, instructors back in my master's program. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, University of the East, uh, Manila, and uh, he has a full-time practice in 1010 Dental Clinic in uh, Manila itself. Uh, he owns uh, Bio, that's uh, the Biomechanical Institute of uh, orthodontics. Uh, it's a training academy and uh, he has trained more than 200 uh, uh, students. Uh, 200 of them have graduated from his academy. He is associated and he has his hold on many, many countries, including the Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Myanmar. Um, I, he, the best part about him is he balances his life. Uh, not like me. Uh, I'm always cursed by my family that I don't give them enough time, but he has all the time in the world for his wife, Diane, and his wonderful daughter, Solana. I have the time now in the quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and, and, and moreover, his uh, clinical interests are uh, on uh, the biological re response uh, and tissue response uh, to orthodontic forces. And uh, his research interests are basically on the, uh, on periodontally compromised uh, dentitions and uh, associated orthodontic mechanics and also asymmetries as we're gonna be discussing today. So today's topic is basically, I think pretty close to his heart and uh, he's gonna be giving you a very different insight on how he identifies certain malocclusions, uh, the etiology basically, and uh, how he treats them in order to get a very holistic approach along with uh, a lot about asymmetries. So um, without any further delay, let's get to it. Dr. Pao, the stage is yours. All right, thank you, Dr. Adith. Uh, thank you for setting the bar so high last time. And I invite most of your friends. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you everyone for coming here, uh, for listening to our webinar, Botched, uh, which is our orthodontic uh, damage control lecture series. And for today, we're gonna talk about the episode on the episode, on the second episode, and it is the tale of malocclusion and asymmetries. So, um, so let me just tell you a little bit about botch. So uh, Dr. Adit and I came up with this um, with this idea of talking about uh, our, our cases. Well, you know, the usual type of conversation we have is about our our own botch up cases, and we thought that hey, maybe some other people could learn about our botch ups. And so uh, so this lecture series is basically an orthodontic damage control lecture series on orthodontic cases. These case scenarios, the case scenarios in these presentations, whether it be diagnostic or mechanical, are of or may have been sought for consult from the speakers or from us. So more than the solutions, we would like to share the skills to detect it and also the thought processes involved in managing these situations. So uh, again, Dr. Inada, go a long <laughs> way back. We still got our hair back then. Uh, now, uh, you know, things fade away along with time. <laughs> I think this was a picture of us in Russia, was it? I don't know, it was in Thailand, right? <laughs> yeah, Thailand. Uh, Thailand. <laughs> All right, so uh, last week, uh, Dr. Adi talked about the orthotic screw-ups, and screw-up is a slang for uh, to make mistakes. So pretty much we want to talk to uh, the people in our own generation. That's why we're using this terminology. But the nice thing about um, last week was Dr. Adith basically uh, broke it down into two types where you have the technical screw-ups and the non-technical screw-ups. 
so your non-technical screw-ups will be more on the psychological side. You can be a very good orthodontist, but still fail because of these non-technical screw-ups. And at the same time, anybody could experience these technical screw-ups where you have diagnostic screw-ups and also your mechanical screw-ups. So for today, I would like to emphasize more on the diagnostic screw-ups. And these diagnostic screw-ups may be a variety of bot scenarios um, that uh, where we, you know, you can have this uh, investigative or diagnostic procedures, clinical thinking processes, which affect your treatment planning to the different stages. So we have to understand it from a perspective. Let me just fix my screen here. So the last time I think we spoke about uh, extraction and non-extraction being a, a, a major part of the diagnostic screw up. And uh, this time, I think we're gonna go back into the etiology itself and Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, when you talk about diagnostic screw ups, uh, pretty much we have to think about it from a perspective that when you receive your uh, diagnostic parameters or casts or pictures or x rays, whatever you may have, if it's already erroneous, basically, whatever your diagnosis is, whether you diagnose it accurately, if the diagnostic parameters themselves are already um, a failure, or a botch, then the rest of your whole treatment may be screwed up. And this is what I want to talk about um, this evening right now. So let's just go jump into it, right? So I have a case here, and this is pretty much a botch up case. As you can see, we already have this um, uh, flat, thick wire already, but then it's still the, all the teeth are still not leveled in the line. But the line, the wire is already leveled in the line. So there's a few things that we can see oh, from this uh... case. I have yep. a small request over here. Um, um, the viewers are requesting you to just speak a little slower. All right. All right. So, um, so when we look at this case, basically what we see here is, uh, for example, the bracket heights, which is uh, obviously an error. All right. Now, how about here? We see excess cement. Although, you know, this is this is a um, material album. When you look at the uh, the brackets when I remove them, you can see all these excess cements all over the brackets and pretty much, you know, you, that, that's, a, it, it's like laminates. And we also have a screwed up mechanics in this case. If you look at it, pretty much you have a case like this and it's, it's in this kind of orientation. And when you're using this power chain to, to level your occlusal plane, basically that's not what you want to happen. What, what you need is you need the wire, you need to engage the wire into the uh, bracket slot in order for you to level it and you can't use a power chain. If you use a power chain as such in this case, what happens here is it constricts your arch. But uh, this is the several botch ups of this case. Now the real botch up around this case is here. You're gonna be able to see it. Is the asymmetry that you're gonna find here. Now. It, when I was treating this patient, this patient, we were able to almost get into finishing, but the problem with my, my main problem with this patient is the, uh, the compliance of the patient. She didn't come in regularly and she usually get brackets popped off. And when she had her third molars coming out, she was 16 around that time and her third molars were already coming out. I asked her to remove it, but because of budget constraints, they can't uh, get it out. So what happened was, if you look over here in the posteriors, and this was several months after this one, it changed my whole occlusal pain, my, my whole orientation. Now to just break it down, to break this asymmetry down, if you look closer into this video, you're gonna be able to see that the midline are coinciding when they're moving. That means the jaws know, or the muscles know where they, the jaw has to be. But in this situation, when the patient is trying to occlude, she's actually struggling to get it in contact. This is something that's commonly seen. What we're seeing here is actually a deflected mandibular position. So let me just share to you about the anatomy of that. In this simulation, what I'm gonna show you is the effect of the third molar that pushed those second molars up to that effect. And now that I have this kind of um, nibbler, or I mean, this, this position of these posteriors, instead of the, the jaw coming in and interdigitating properly, what happens is it hits on a premature contact within the cusps. And as it hits the cusps, 
this is what happens because she needs to go into a maximum intercuspation where you need to break down food. You can't break down food in this position. So she needs to shift it and she needs to find for it. And um, basically it causes this deviation. Now the problem is when we uh, diagnose these patients, we sometimes diagnose these patients in this kind of orientation where they are in the maximum intercuspation. And the problem is that this position is just a deflected position, and it's something that happens on uh, not almost every time. And there, as we coincide the actual with what's happening on the simulation. Now, I'm going to show you these simulations or these animations without the brackets, without the mechanics, just so that we can be on a common ground on the treatment objectives. If I put in some brackets, we might get biased as to how we want to um, move these teeth. Okay, so for example, like that, we want to torque in that posterior in order for us to relate the mandible again properly with the maxilla. Now, let me go to another case. Now, this is another type uh, of Paul, I, I think, I think uh, I'm going to stop you there. Yeah. Uh, we, have a, we have a question uh, from Dr. Alok uh, Puri. Uh, he's asking whether this particular patient had any signs of uh, a temporomandibular uh, issue. Temporomandibular issue, no. Yeah, a TMD? No. When you diagnose that particular case? No. She okay. did not have the asymmetry to start with. Okay, so this was created uh, atrogenically. Is what you're no, trying to say? It came out when the third molars came out. Absolutely. So, so, so this is a very important point over here that uh, uh, we we must we must possibly take into consideration that uh, eruption of the third molar can create uh, an uh, inadvertent uh, issue, which was never there to start with, right? Definitely. And there's and a lot I, of debate around that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, one of the debates I, I possibly know is the eruption of the third molar actually causing insides of crowding. But then uh, that's that's been debated and we'll, we'll get to that a little later. Uh, I, I also saw some, uh, 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 the oral hygiene of the particular patient was, was really bad. Yeah. Uh, can I have uh, some kind of an outlook on that? And how does that affect your particular uh, treatment uh, issues? Because uh, I, for one, have a lot of issues with oral hygiene, a lot of plaque and gingival uh, hyperplasia alongside yeah. that. Well, at, at this point, you know, um, all right. So as you can see, we were going well with our treatment and she was not compliant. She, mm -hmm. she wasn't coming back frequently. She wasn't cleaning her teeth properly. Her brackets usually pop out. And I came to that point where I had to remove the brackets because mm -hmm. of the non-compliance of the patient. And the gums growing up. And the gums growing up. Okay. I see. I, I, I get your point. Yeah, uh -huh. I think we can move forward. All right. Now we have this uh, case. Now this is another type of bot shop. And as you can see, there, there's an orientation to the, uh, to the molar like this. Now you won't re really see this in natural kind of malocclusions. So when this patient actually visited me, it, my immediate, my knee-jerk reaction was to remove the wire because the wire that was installed on this patient was a reverse curve of speed. And in, in this kind of situation where the patient wore it too long and she was complaining that her dentist wasn't in town anymore, there was nothing that you should do. Uh, I mean, in a certain situation, this is the only thing that you should do and make it rest. Now, I'm going to show you from the sagittal part. Uh, uh, from this uh, frontal side, I mean this uh, buccal side, how this affected the position of your mandible, I mean of the, of the molars. Now this is easy to treat when you just think about it, when you look at it from this perspective, all you have to do is just put it back, right? Now the tricky thing in this situation is that when you look, look at it from the front, after wearing that reverse curve for so much time, this actually happened and also affected the other side. And uh, to orient this with the upper, okay. Uh, yeah, this is just an article of, I mean, this is the uh, from the textbook, William Prophet. Uh, basically what he's saying about the uh, reverse curve speed wires. I personally use uh, reverse curve speed wires, maybe about uh, one in 10 patients. I don't really use them um, all over. But uh, Dr. Prophet actually reminds us that it's, it's contraindicated. It, he's very gentle. He's not, he wasn't gentle in how he said it. It was an error. 
Although, you know, there's some there's still some cases that you need this rectangular curve of speed. So if you're gonna need it, you have to make sure that this patient is monitored. And in this patient, she wasn't monitored because this dentist just went to another country. And for the upper, if it's acceptable, lingual root torque is acceptable, then you can pretty much use it. But when you're using your reverse curve of speed, when I use my reverse curve of speed, I pretty much um, have to make sure that my patient is compliant. It's just how I use my multiple edgewise archwire archwares. So now going into the problem that we want to talk about in this evening is that when you have this orientation with the patient, you see that there's a massive symmetry of this patient. It's just going to the left. And the effect is that uh, because of that reverse curve speed, it made the jaw, the lower jaw, relate to the upper this way. So to give us perspective on, on what if I upright this lower molars and I want you to look closely, I'm not gonna treat the upper, okay? I'm just gonna treat it intra-arch. I'm just gonna upright the, the, the teeth that were affected back to their position and I'm supposed to expect something that should show that. And uh, this is part of the treatment, okay? Where we were able to get some initial um, corrections, but still when we level the line, it gave more, it, it basically showed more problems coming from the upper as when it was when we received it. So as you can see, there's still a lot of deviation, but it was less than a little bit, but now we have, have this different kind of deviation from, I mean, this uh, canting from the upper. All right. So do you have any yep. questions? Do we have any so questions? Uh, no, we don't have a question, but yeah, I do right. have a comment. Good. Uh, uh, is, uh, could, you, could you go back on the previous slide, please? Yeah, uh, the one before that. So one thing is that, yeah, as you mentioned that the doctor had used a reverse curve of speed wire. One thing I would just like to add, as you've mentioned from Profit, that the drawback of using a reverse curve night eye is that the uh, anterior talks are anterior. Uh, uh, the lower uh, anterior are on the previous slide, please? labially torque right so the they, they procline the and the yeah. roots yeah. are lingually uh, the roots uh, ling yeah. uh, alongside one of the common sense that i have just clinically use a round reverse the and uh, I've, I've seen that happening uh the, the they just stick yeah they lose they lose torque and so they they, they just go in uh, that creates uh, some kind of an asymmetry, as as you've uh, shown uh, exactly yeah. over here. Uh, but I, I, what I want, what I'm interested in is gain space. Particular uh, molar in. Uh, sorry, we're lo we're losing you a little bit. How did you gain space? Ah, uh, extraction. To I'm sorry, I totally missed that. Yeah. And then uh, was there anything else in, in, in it? In the sense, I see a stop to wire. And uh, uh, how did you insert the wire? And how did you uh, prevent the reciprocal action on the premolars while getting that molar in? Uh, we uh, Initially, what I tried to do is I tried to use these interarch elastics. Until I said that, all right, this will affect my upper since uh, my lower is in such a bad position. So I decided to forego it and uh, decided to just uh, patiently upright it with wire mechanics. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the next slide. I think I think the issue your canting was uh, because of the use of those cross bite elastics. I see that the left side has extruded possibly because of the use of the cross bite elastics is probably, I, I think maybe that is the reason. Mm -hmm. it's, it's highly likely. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So oh, one more question from Dr. Puri again as to, uh, it's, it's regarding the second molars involvement. Uh, Dr. Puri is asking uh, as to why did you not in the second molars in this particular treatment and what is the effect of doing so and when would you possibly involve the second molars? Mm -hmm. Now, um, in this stage, uh, as you saw that we, hold on, 
All right, let me just bring it back. Okay, so in this stage, what I did was I stopped doing the retraction of the K9 uh, to go back into leveling aligning because I needed the lower arch to get into or under the upper. Now, the reason why I didn't place anything on the second is because for every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. I can't use this as my um, as my anchorage right now because it's actually the most stable of all the other teeth in relation to the upper. So if I use it, I might actually bring that second molar out instead of breaking my first molar in, or I might give a yeah. frostbite for that whole left arch. So I concentrated my mechanics on only on the first molar, and until uh, I'm into the actual space consolidation stage, that's when I'm going to uh, involve my second molars because I need it, I need as much uh, anchorage that I could get for this patient. Doctor Pritam uh, is asking, uh, was any IPR performed? Sorry? Uh, we're losing you a little bit. Dr. Pritam is asking uh, if there was any amount. Dr. Pritam is uh, any amount in this particular case? Uh, I'm losing you on the important stuff. Uh, let me just check. Can you hear me? Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. So uh, Dr. Pritam is asking if uh, you have uh, performed any amount of IPR in this particular no. case. And uh, okay, uh, because you're extracted, right? And yeah. uh, the second question is, uh, did, you, did you see any kind of bite opening during the uprighting? Uh, no, not at all. Probably because of a tip back or something that you would have given on the uh, molars. Well, with, the thing is that when you're treating this kind of patient, you might get an open bite if you're creating premature contacts. But the thing is, when you're trying to fix this teeth into their uh, rightful position, you're supposed to expect some interdigitation to happen, not open bites, unless you're creating open, I mean, unless you're creating um, premature contacts, then that's when you're going to get open bites. So for this one, since we're just trying to bring it back in, open bites, well, not really, not supposed to. And as expected, we did it again. Dr. Ravi Shankar, uh, hello. Thanks for joining us. Uh, he's asking as to how the molar was derotated. Derotated, just wire mechanics. So uh, I think he's already answered this question. I, I think he's just pushed in the wire and uh, used crossbite elastics alongside this uh, to particularly do that. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, rightly so. I, I, think, I think bite opening may have been one of the side effects of this as well, because that would extra, extrude the uh, lower molar creating some kind of a thing. But yeah, uh, somehow it's been controlled. I, I, I assume probably because of uh, some amount of tip back incorporated in the wire that may have helped. Anyways, I think, I think we should move uh, on. Yep. All right. So when we're talking about these problems, when we're talking about problems of symmetry, we want to look a little bit more deeper. And uh, where I would suggest, us, uh, suggest to lead us is into physiology. Now, just to go about in asymmetry, when we talk about asymmetry, we get dental facial imbalance, number one. And that's the most obvious thing because when we look at it from a aesthetic perspective, we see, of course, dental imbalance and also facial imbalance. But when we look deeper, when we look at something that is not static, when we look at something that's more functional, we look at the mandibular deflection during function. And I'm gonna talk about that this whole, um, this whole evening. So this actually, my, my, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that asymmetries are actually caused by vertical discrepancies to about more, uh, to, uh, because of premature contacts that are more than two millimeters. And it's, it's a discrepancy between your inter, okay, there's a lot of terminologies that um, from different regions that would define what this is, but intercuspal uh, position, retruded cusp versus the retruded cuspal position, discrepancies perhaps between the first tooth contact versus the maximum intercuspation, discrepancies versus the uh, centric relation and the centric occlusion. But basically all of these mean the same. So I just want to highlight on this part where you have the mandibular deflection. When you talk about mandibular deflection, okay, I want to go deeper into this. When you talk about deflection, there's a normal movement 
and then you have this deflected movement. And this deflected movement is basically because of a premature contact. But before that, we want to look at this normal movement. The normal movement will be your pure vertical motion, as those guys from Romania, uh, from the face uh, philosophy or the Roth Williams philosophy, uh, would say that it should be purely vertical up and down only. So we can see that there's several ways that how the jaw can move from the frontal axis, terminal hinge, and sagittal axis. And uh, it has been said that nature has blessed us with a marvelously dynamic masticatory system allowing us to function and therefore exist. So what I want to establish right now when we go into this is that we're not dealing with something that is actually static when we're talking about symmetry. So when we're trying to open our mouth, we have this vertical movement where it rotates around the, term, uh, the terminal hinge axis. And then after that, when we're trying to open wide, then it goes to a vertical sagittal as the jaw moves forward and vice versa when it's closing. Now, the question is, how about the frontal axis? What is its participation? Well, the frontal axis doesn't have really a participation in terms of closing and opening and closing the jaw without anything in between. Where the frontal axis would have uh, something to do with in terms of function is when you're chewing. When you're chewing, this is where you're doing your lateral movements or twisting movements. And, um, all right, your lateral, all right, what happened? Okay, so lateral and twisting movements. And it's the same thing that we can see in our asymmetries where, except, uh, but the, the thing, the difference is that in asymmetries, we see a static lateral and twisted position of the mandible. Now, if we could put it this way, in chewing, our problem really is food. That's the reason why the jaw is lateral, uh, going lateral and going twisting. And if you're talking about asymmetries, the, the thing that goes in between the teeth is actually the tooth itself because of these premature contacts. And if it's not the tooth, it could be the restoration that the dentist erroneously did. I've seen this over and over, especially with just very minor um, uh, tooth restorations. So uh, one of these uh, journals that we read broke down these asymmetries into the skeletal, dental and also functional um, asymmetries uh, as the basis for asymmetries. And the, the, the critical thing that I want to talk about here is that when we look at asymmetries, how do we look at them? And what I want to do is I want to break down who are we talking about, uh, the inclusions of who are we trying to talk about here. When we're talking about your skeletal, then uh, those patients are the ones maybe with craniofacial deformities who need surgery, and I'm not talking about them. I'm basically talking about normal beings who were born without any asymmetries. So when you go into the skeletal, you can't judge a person or a, a, a patient um, according to one part grew more than the other side, and it's because of the skeletal, that's why you have this. The reason is because the, the skeletal or the bones, they're flexible and they have a functional adaptation to, to certain functions. And you call that the adaptive remodeling. And then dental, it, this one adopts in position because of the periodontal ligaments. When your lower teeth have no opposing, it basically super erupts and if it has no adjacent, then it collapses. And finally, you have this function where you have a muscular adaptation where your jaw, where it used to, remembers where it used to close it, has to adopt because of new occlusal settings. So let's think about this. Were normal people actually born with asymmetries? No. I haven't seen a baby with a jaw looking different. Uh, dental. Did they even, did, did these babies have teeth uh, under normal circumstances? No, they don't. How about the neuromuscular memory of the patient? When these kids were growing, or when everybody grows, you have this normal up and down movement of your jaw, but it gets screwed up when you get the permanent dentition turnover. So my argument here is that you're gonna see this asymmetries more of because of the skeletal adjust, uh, adjustment due to the occlusal setups, okay? So if a malocclusion could influence your jaw, to cause have to have a facial asymmetry in the same way that you fix your occlusion, you can return the jaw back to its own position through this growth, um, through this uh, adaptation. Now, usually the common thinking is that you, you can't move that. You have to do surgery or you have to do it something, you have to do something faster. Now, some people, what they do is they use splints, right? They use um, occlusal splints. Um, uh, uh, I don't really use splints. 
I go directly into fixing the occlusal plane, but these are the bases, okay? So mandibular growth is closely interlinked with joint status. Whatever your joint status is, that's how your mandibular is gonna grow into. Your joint status is basically dictated by how your teeth occlude through the ICP and RCP, yes. Okay, so uh, that, that was loaded. And there are many questions uh, over here. So let's, let's uh, I mean, the last case I think has got a lot of attention over here. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Alok Kumar was asking, how, uh, how can you correct the deep bite uh, uh, in, in one of the cases? Uh, I, I think you'll have to roll over and uh, go back there. In one of your cases probably had a deep bite. Not yet. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah. that case yet. Yeah. Uh, did, did any of your case have a deep bite? And he was asking, how could you correct the deep bite? Not yet. I haven't shown any deep bite. I will show uh, one later. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's, let's leave that for later. And the second is, how did you correct the upper left side scanting on that particular case? All right. I'll, I'll get there. Uh, um, up for that, for that uh, last patient? Yes, for the last patient. Hmm. Um, well, honestly, I haven't fixed that yet. Until now, uh, two years after she was referred to me, we're still mm -hmm. doing leveling and aligning, and we're still okay. uh, bringing the jaw into uh, the best position. So I think I think you got the diagnosis right, and uh, Doctor Saeed has given a wonderful suggestion over there in order to how you could probably prevent or even control it right now. And I think I'm in the same opinion. Uh, he is like, do you think an IZC on the right side uh, and an attachment to a hook? between the lateral and the canine would have prevented the upper cant while derotating the molar. Of course, I mean, you, uh, he's, he's, he's saying that you probably uh, could have used indirect anchorage and then use the elastics, the crossbite elastics down. So that would have kept the upper uh, plane uh, stable and just got the lower corrected at the same time. So that, that yeah, that, that makes sense. I think. Uh, yeah, what, what I would do is I wouldn't place an IZC. I would just place an a interradicular screw over there. I don't see the need to place an IZC there. I could just place this interradicular screw and this uh, hook it with a power chain or something onto the wire. Uh, of course, I would have to correct. I would have to take care of the buckle inclination that, that goes along with that. Uh, the buckle tipping of the upper uh, posterior teeth. But yeah, there are many ways of doing that. You could just possibly torque the wire as well inside the... Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, Dr. Wiki has asked, what is the prognosis of sheer orthodontic treatment without surgery in skeletal asymmetry? Uh, well, if you're talking about skeletal asymmetry in terms of, um, like what? Craniofacial deformities, craniofacial deformities, uh, perhaps? No, it's, can... it's, 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 yeah, it's probably a dental deformity which is traversed yeah. to a skeletal deformity. I mean, it's, it's already skeletal. The one, one side uh, of the jaw has already right. grown more. Uh-huh. So if you correct that uh, orthodontically, prognosis... if you correct that orthodontically, I think he's asking, what is the prognosis there? How stable is it? All right. Well, uh, correcting it orthodontically has nothing to do with the prognosis. What I would say is that um, uh, void of this uh, of the braces, right? You just position this teeth in the proper position where it's functional in relation to your jaw, in relation to your to your joints, in relation to your um, to your muscles, you pretty much have a good stability. And I think you mm -hmm. talked about this last time with your uh, with your trip to uh, to Texas, where these um, practitioners in Tweed um, Foundation they don't put your removable uh, retainers right, and they get this good stable teeth for like 20, 40 years. And the reason why is because you put it in a functional relationship, in harmony with the soft tissues. In harmony with everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Nuri, thanks for joining us. Uh, she's like, please, doctor, is there any particular age limit in treating facial asymmetry? I would say none. If you can, mm -hmm. uh, if your teeth are bounded by your periodontal ligaments, I think that you can move these teeth in certain directions that you need or certain positions that you need to until you reach something that is maybe ideal, and if not ideal, maybe a camouflage. And if you need more surgery, then you put in some surgery. I see. I see. I have, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to be waiting for the end of the segment to ask you all of those. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right. All right. So let's continue. Yeah. 
All right, so my second argument is that a condo was once considered a growth center, but is now regarded as a growth site, right? Without autonomous growth potential. So your, your condo, contrary to previous reports that it has an autonomous growth potential, it doesn't have it. So people sometimes talk about asymmetries in such that your mandible, the right side grew more than the left side because of, you know, just growth. It wasn't dentally related. So when you look at it, actually it's a growth site. When we say it's a growth site, you have this remodeling capacity or a good remodeling capacity because of the secondary cartilage. Next argument is condylar growth is adaptive in nature. So the volume of a condom in response to the function of surrounding uh, structures rather than to uh, the hormones, okay? So your condyles would uh, grow rather according to the functional demands of the situation or the demands of the structure rather than to your hormones, okay? And my fourth argument is the status of the TMJ has been shown to influence adaptive condylar growth. And the fifth argument is that a condyle comprised of secondary cartilage serves the most growth side for the mandible by responding to functional demands uh, according to the surrounding environment. And basically what I'm trying to point at is that asymmetries okay, in normal individuals were developed by the functional demands. Where, do we, where is the core of functional demands? The core of the functional demands is happening between the teeth, how the teeth relate with one another. They're supposed to relate with costifosa relationship and with no premature contacts in the posterior. But once you get these premature contacts, once you get these malocclusions, then you tend to move your jaw towards a certain direction where your, your muscles are trying to find through proprioception this proper position of the mandible until it loses itself because it tries to adopt and adopt and adopt to a certain position that it, does, it, that it didn't have back then. So we can look at the condylar growth uh, characteristics in this perspective. The condyle grows towards the functional particular surfaces in normal growth. The direction of condylar growth is anterior and superior for the reason that anterior, you have that, um, you have your, uh, your pterygoids and superior because you have all these ligaments suspending your, uh, your condyles. And as long as you get that stretch or that function between these uh, muscles and these ligaments, basically what you're gonna get is uh, when you have tension, right, orthodontics, Basically, that means position. And third, the cortical bone covering the functional surface of a growing condyle is very thin. Excessive or insufficient loading of the functional surface of the condyle may have inhibitory effects. They have seen that for these inhibitory sites, it, the jaw tends to move towards that affected site. And moderate joint loading seems necessary for normal condyle growth in which to displace an important role. So going back here, when you talk about normal movement, what we want to establish is that from the normal movement, it goes to a deflected movement. And in the deflected movement, basically what we're trying to say here is that you have a post-interference motion. So once you hit that first tooth contact or the first tooth contact or your retreating cuspal position or your centric relation, as some would say, from that point to a clench, then you have your ICP or intercuspal position, maximum intercuspation or your centric occlusion. And that's a deflected position. Let me just go deeper into this. This deflective position or deflective pathway can be seen through this possible exporter movements. And that's, this is basically what I want to revolve around in this um, lecture. So let's first discuss what occlusion is. When we look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary, what you're going to see is that it's the position, it's defined this way, the position of teeth when the jaws are closed. Now, the interesting thing here is that from a non-scientific basis, they were able to line it up in this way. Closed is regarding to the muscle, the jaws are regarding to the bone, the teeth are regarding to the teeth, of course, and the jaws are closed. Basically, you're talking about your temporal mandibular joint conjoining them both. And when we kind of think of what is the keyword in this definition, we, we, you know, it, you tend to go towards the T, the boat, the TMJ, the muscle. Actually, for me, if you're going to ask me, the keyword here is when. Why when? The keyword here is when, because when you talk about occlusion, it's, that it, it's just a momentary situation happening inside the mouth, a momentary situation. It's not what's actually happening like majority of the time. So to say that we're going to diagnose our patients in a fully occluded manner, this is just one moment in what the patient is actually experiencing. What am I trying to say? We have to look at our patients from a movement perspective. So here's the process movement. So just as a review, 
you have that anterior guidance from your maximum enteric patient. For some patients, they go into a protrusive state. Some, most of us don't, and then go into a maximum opening. At this point, there's a symmetrical pterygoid flex. At this point, this is where, okay, everybody's going to try to open their mouth. But at this point, your pterygoids are supposed to flex symmetrically as how you were trained when you were growing up. So that position of your mandible is a symmetrical physiologic position where the midlines should coincide. So I guess everybody should try it, look at themselves in the mirror, try to open wide and try to check whether your midlines are on. So from this maximum opening, we have a translatory arc that goes into the vertical rest position. So from the vertical rest position, this is where the highlight is, because as it closes on the rotational arc, that first tooth contact without clenching, that first tooth contact without clenching is the start for deflective path. So this first tooth contact can be defined also in this certain terminologies. So I just listed them down here, retruded cuspal position, premature contact, interference. They all seem uh, pathological. But then when we talk about centric relation, the tricky thing here is that when you talk about centric relation, it sounds physiological. It sounds like a perfect position over here in the condyle, yeah, condylar area. But basically, if you're going to ask me, it's a malocclusion state. This is where the first tooth contact is. And that first tooth contact is actually your problem. I'm going to talk more about this later. And then when you clench your jaws, okay, from that first tooth contact, you go into this maximum inter interdigitation, an intercuspal position, a habitual bite, also known as your bite of convenience. Some would, again, define it as the centric occlusion. And again, it's kind of misleading because, again, we, we were taught that this is a perfect situation. But actually, if you're going to ask me again, for most of us with malocclusions, this is a deflected mandibular position. The keyword here is deflected mandibular position. So from your RCP to your MI, where that's the end, that's where your end, uh, that's your deflective path. So pseudo class two, pseudo class threes can be diagnosed in this, uh, in this kind of um, um, reading or this kind of analysis. So if you look over here, there is a class one relationship with your molars, but of course with ortho, natural movements tend to supra erupt your and as expected, it costs a class two. And in this um, situation, this is a pseudo class two, if you're going to ask me, because it's not, patient isn't really a class two, it's just a position of the jaw that rotated downward and backward. When you eliminate that posterior premature contact, you intrude, the, intrude that upper posteriors, then you tend to move your mandible upward and forward to a class two position. Here's another scenario that most of us in, um, encounter the loss of lower six. The loss of lower six is a pseudo class two as well. If you look over here, the loss of lower six would cause your maxillary six to supra erupt. And as it supra erupts, the tendency here is to cause a premature contact over there and cause your mandible to go downward and backward. Over here on the right side of the page, on the left side of the patient, you're able to see that there is a difference in the canine position. But over here, when you look over here, okay, Look at the animation. You're going to see as I intrude that first molar, there's a change in mandibular position, right? There's a change in the mandibular position causing a class one, uh, a better class one relationship there. So just by the intrusion of that. So this is actually how I approach my patients, especially with the loss of lower six. If I intrude that up for six first, I reverse that effect and bring it into a relationship where your maxillary and your mandible void of the teeth would relate into a better position. In another perspective, this is also the same uh, perspective where we can see this class three pseudo, pseudo class threes. In this patient, for most of us, we might say this is a true class three. I tell you it's not because the first tooth contact is actually on an edge to edge. Now, the thing is that we have to remind the patient of that by using perhaps for some, some would use a myofunctional appliance. Now, I would say that a better treatment over here because the patient is growing and you have to intercept this. You have to be more intentional by using a, a, uh, a um, growth modifying appliance or an ortho appliance rather than myofunctional appliance. But I chose the myofunctional appliance, why? Because I wanted to remind my muscles first where it is. I want you to look at the video here on the left side. As you're seeing it, look at the mid face, it's coming forward. And as you're seeing the lower jaw, look at it rotate downward. from the previous situation. So now after that, this patient now develops this habitual bite. 
And when you look at this, now you're going to treat this patient in a whole different perspective. And this is what I'm trying to say that you have to diagnose your patient in, in, in the open, uh, somewhat in the first tooth contact rather than a maximum or deflected position. Occlusally, look at this, there's no difference. Yes, there's no difference, but the difference is over here. As you can see, if you look here on the picture on the lower, you're going to be able to see that, all right, let's try to diagnose this. What if I, I mean, uh, I mean, let's try to treat this patient, expand the upper. But if I expand the upper, that doesn't make sense because I have a space over here. So if I expand the upper, then I'm going to get more space. There's really no space problem in the upper. For the lower, I have a class three. Most of us would think, oh, I need to extract this one, the three, four, and the uh, four, four. And by extracting that, I will put this canine into a class one position, I mean, class two position. And that still doesn't make sense. So if we have this knowledge of putting it in the postal treatment, we see this premature contact, we, our treatments change drastically. If you look here, now the treatment plan would be to flare the upper interiors and simply retract the lower interiors. Just that simple by correcting the pseudo class three. This is another case Dr. Inadith worked on uh, when he was still here in the Philippines for his training. This part was uh, not from us. We got it from the original dentist, but I would say that this one is also a pseudo class three, except that this patient uh, developed because of the consistent this uh, deflection of the, uh, the mandible forward, the condyles or the ray was basically adopted and it became longer according to the functional demands. Now, Dr. Adit was able to bring it into this position until um, he didn't have really much time. So he gave it to me and I fixed it in this position. Now, as you can see, there's not really some drastic um, space consolidation happening here, but there's just some constriction happening within the arch to correct that inter-arch relationship. Here's the facial. Now, as you can see, the simple mechanics, I mean, the simple, uh, it's going to be a simple or a, a subtle effect, but it's actually kind of dramatic as well. But then the treatment modality or the treatment approach isn't really that dramatic. It's just some kind of constriction and you're not overdoing things. So from another perspective, we can look at it like this. So if it's a pseudo class three, then the patient hits here first. And then after he hits, he protrudes the mandible and this mandible goes all the way forward. If we are going to diagnose this patient in this position, our treatment plan is going to be kind of tough. So I would decide to treat uh, this patient or diagnose the patient on this perspective. I would constrict the lower and also the upper and get the teeth in the proper position. But then if I diagnose this patient in this perspective, it's kind of tricky because we have to think about certain movements that would equate to some kind of final setup. So it's a matter of perspective. I think everyone has seen this picture of Prince William uh, showing a finger, or maybe not. So another perspective here is looking from the front. Now I'm going to go into the second part of what I'm trying to argue with. Do we have any questions there? Yeah, 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 yeah. We have, we have a lot of questions over here. Okay, so uh, before you go on to the next segment, let's just finish off with this. This is very, very interesting, and this is a very new perspective to diagnosis by itself. Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. John Ursia, uh, forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, uh, is uh, asking, uh, what can you say about sectional mechanics before leveling for particle anchorage control? Uh, example uh, is rickets or Burstone's arch. So would you go in for sectional mechanics before leveling and lining? I mean, probably sagittal AP movement before uh, your leveling alignment. All right, so uh, it depends. In order to uh, get things get things in control. Uh -huh. It depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, by the book, if we're going to follow the statically indeterminate system, we have to go through the leveling alignment, space consolidation, and then into the finishing. But when we're talking mm -hmm. about the statically determinate system, then we're talking about this perspective that doctor has. So, um, yes, you can go into that perspective that you do something first intra arch before you go into, uh, into correcting the inter arch. So that's what I usually do. I usually bond the worst arch first and then I correct whatever is happening there. Uh, for example, for that class three, the, the right thing to do there is retract first the lower interiors and then that's when you work on your upper to see whether your hypothesis is correct. Absolutely. Uh, 
I mean, even I do that uh, most of the times. Uh, I've, I've moved out of the continuous arch wire system when 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 needed. Uh, if there is if there is uh, an extruded mole or if there is uh, a deep bite or something of that sort, I try to correct that first and then then uh, continue the case because that makes things very easy. Uh, the second yeah. question is by uh, Dr. Baskar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, if if there is a functional shift, then probably orthodontics can correct it or reduce the asymmetry. But if the asymmetry is purely skeletal, isn't it better off to just inform the patient as part of the informed consent that your jaw wouldn't change if we do braces only? Okay, I lost you a little bit there, but I think I got a question. Now, that's a good point. I would definitely, regardless of the case, even if I'm very optimistic about the case, there's always a disclaimer that you cannot guarantee anything. And I think that has to be a practice for everybody. But then uh, this is what exactly what I'm saying, that when you have skeletal asymmetries, we have to look at it from a different perspective. We have been taught in contemporary ortho that skeletal asymmetries are because of imbalance of one side of the bone. Now, um, I, I just discussed, or my arguments here is that it, your, your skeletal or your bone changes, okay? It changes, the morphology of your bone changes according to the functional demands. And it's, con it's, it's consistent with the whole body. If you, if you put yourself into consistent jogging, um, training, your body, or you're, you're going to get more upright. And in the same way, that's the same thing that's happening inside the mouth. If your functional demands uh, deter you from going into that normal situation, then you're going to develop the skeletal asymmetries. So I would say that for skeletal asymmetries, these are caused by dental asymmetries. You fix the dental. If it's a skeletal, all the more you must use your TADS in those situations so you can absolutely independently move these teeth to give a setting for your teeth to land on. So once you fix that landing spot, then you're going to fix your maximum manipular relationship. I'll still uh, be yeah. optimistic with those cases, but yet I'll still give it this. No, because, yeah, because, because uh, I've been treating a lot of these asymmetry cases as well. Uh, they are adults and uh, yeah. I have identified a certain, uh, a certain cause, a root cause, like you've mentioned. Uh, I have uh, one of the, one of, one of this case, uh, uh, it, it had an inset lateral incisor. Mm -hmm. And he was so from possibly the age of eight or nine, right? And over a period of time, uh, the jaw grew and everything everything happened. But with uh, in, in consideration to that inset lateral incisor, so so the right side moved more and it developed into an asymmetry altogether. And of course, because he is in a growth phase, the asymmetry, uh, which was actually caused dentally has now caused this particular side to grow more. And now that it's travel, traversed from a dental uh, issue to a skeletal full-blown asymmetry. And no matter how much you treat these cases, uh, I mean, I have treated that case, it's a perfect dental class one, no, 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 no transverse issues, but still I was not able to get a hundred percent skeletal correction on that. Mm -hmm. So there are yeah. some cases, there are some cases with a huge midline shift and all those things. And I've corrected it. Uh, I thought that it was a skeletal asymmetry, but after treatment, it, it became 100% right. But there are these cases which I have also treated, and I was able to get just maybe 50 or 60% skeletal correction, but 100% dental correction. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the interesting point, well, I'm going to talk about this later, but I'm going to put it, um, let me just go ahead of myself, is that yes, there would be some patients, especially in those growing years still, that if you get this asymmetries corrected, I usually see asymmetries when you develop, when there's an interchange of the uh, permanent, from the uh, temporary to the permanent teeth. So in these kinds of patients, your growth is active. When you do certain changes within the mandible, just as like how your, um, uh, your orthodontic appliances would affect your lower jaw, it definitely affects as well the facial feature. Now, you said something that you're, you can fix these teeth but then the face still doesn't correct, even if you put it in perfect. Now the situation there is not, you fix the relationship of your uh, muscles of mastication. So according to the mastication, the functional demands of your mastication is already fixed, but then what's attaching for these, and these usually happen in older patients, in older patients. So when it happens to older patients, the situation now changes because the growth is not on your side. The bone is much more harder. But then you have to give it some time. What do I mean? 
it's your facial muscles, their uh, insertion and their origins, right? Or the muscles of facial expressions that are attached in certain areas within your maxilla and mandible. That would fix your asymmetry as long as you fix the movement of your mandible and eliminating that frontal axis or that twisting and lateral movement. I see. Yeah, I think we can carry on. All right. So from the second, from another perspective, we can look at this postal border movement from the anterior perspective, the anterior border movements. And this is where we would usually see asymmetries. We usually look at patients with asymmetries from the front. So let me just see how this will give you more value. So from a maximum intercuspatial position, this uh, postal movement basically tells us that you have this canine guidance which is um, shown there by the curve on that portion. Now, when this patient opens wide and then they close, right? This again would be your first tooth contact, retruded cusp or your RCP, your uh, premature contact, interference, your CR, your malocclusion. And then the relationship of your jaws would be something like this. And this is, if I may say, those people who use splits like the uh, face group or uh, um, yeah, face group. They use splints to fix first the temporomandibular joint to restore the anatomy of this joint in this certain um, anatomy. So they put a splint and they orient it in this position. Now again, after that clenching, then it moves into this position where you have another relationship of your TMJ with your ICP. And this now is going to be your MI or your intercuspal position. ICP or your habitual bite, bite of convention, uh, uh, bite of convenience, or your CO, or again, your deflected in the position. So let me just bring you through this case. If you look over here, what you're going to see is several um, malocclusions. So you see that the plane is different. You see the line of actions are also different. You see infractions on certain areas. There's a midline off or non coinciding. Infractions are also happening here. You have a gingival halo. Again, the levels. You look over here, but you look over here on the occlusal perspective, you see the situation in the maxilla and the manual that they're actually symmetric. And if they are symmetric, then how come they're not relating with one another symmetrically? So your vertical actually can, can affect your situation. So here you see these other situations. So let me just show you the malocclusion in this patient. So this is a functional recording. And as you can see, as the mandible opens and closes, it shifts midline on and it shifts towards the right side. I'm gonna give you a more detailed view of that later. But what we can see here is you have this buccalized 1-7 where the palatal cusp is hanging low below the occlusal plane. And then you have a super erupted second molar. Now this happened because of the super, I mean the eruption of the third molars. I can say that because this patient is actually me. This is my dentist. So in this situation, this is how we would like to say it, is that this palatal cusp, again, is hanging low. That tooth is super erupted. And as my lower jaw relates, midline is on. It closes on, all right? But it hits this, um, it hits the cusp, and then it slides towards the right into a clenched position, or again, a deflected mandibular position. And here is coinciding the um, simulation with the actual, with the midline off. And here's the difference from the ICP to the RCP. Midline on to the shift. Midline on to the shift. That's the deflected mandibular position. Now this patient, uh, on the emphasis of this part is as you're seeing it, this was a patient of one of my students here in Manila, and he, she was referred to him. And as you can see, there's a massive asymmetry. And natural asymmetries are much more easier. I mean, they're very difficult to correct, but they're much more easier to correct than asymmetries caused by iatrogen causes. Now, looking further into this case, what you're going to be able to see here is that uh, there's a loss of lower six, which caused the super eruption of the upper eights from the posterior, causing this mandibular rotation downward and backward. So if we break down this case into this kind of perspective, this is how the teeth are oriented in this patient. Eights are super erupted this way, and this side is super erupted this way. So when the patient closes his mouth or her mouth, 
it relates here in the posterior this way, the premature contact, and then shifts towards this side to adopt into a maximum intercuspation. And as you can see, I want you to isolate the teeth, I mean, isolate the bone and look at their orientation of the bone with the maxilla. This is totally, totally asymmetric. Now, when we fix the teeth per se, we level line, we can expect that jaw to go into its proper position by fixing it orthodontically. So let me show you the, uh, the development of this case for uh, one of my students. If you look here on the facial photo, you're gonna be able to see that this patient, all right, I'm getting ahead myself. So we were able to des um, design a treatment plan where we said that it's this part of the patient that is actually super erupted and we need to place the tad over here to intrude that site to balance her occlusal plane. And as you can see, there's a balance of occlusal plane and this is how it affected the patient. This is one of the pictures that I asked from uh, that student showing uh, how the development is and pretty much we see uh, an, a dental, uh, um, more symmetric relationship. It's hard to say a bit. So what I'm trying to propose is that an intra-arch treatment would yield the ideal inter-arch relationship. What do I mean? If we treated the same case this way, right, where you're using inter-arch elastics and you're just forcing the issue, trying to fix the teeth to the teeth and not addressing the, the mandibular problem, you're going to have a dental symmetry but still have a deflected mandibular position. And these cases are the ones that you usually see that it's already perfect. You remove all the brackets and then the patient will come back about six months after saying that there's a bad relapse or if there's no bad relapse, the patient is going to say that my jaw still hurts. And the difference with this kind of treatment as to what has been proposed here, as you can see, is that we fix the jaw, the teeth in the jaw to give a more symmetrical relationship. So by putting an implant on this side and intruding those teeth, basically you're gonna be able to interrelate the upper and middle properly. As to this side, where you just interrelated the maxilla and the mandible as far as the teeth can be. So I think this is one of your questions, I mean, one of the things we discussed a few moments ago, Dr. Adit, where you're able to correct it dentally, but still there's no perfect skeletal relationship. One, it could have been because of a relative treatment. Relative treatment in a sense that you use the upper against the lower or the lower against the upper. If we use our uh, TADs and we position this tea, uh, these teeth in the proper position, then we're gonna be able to position it in a better way. And to say that the healing would happen in a certain way as to how we're gonna address that facial asymmetry is that we have to wait for those facial muscles to orient the jaws in a better way. So. In these kinds of treatments where you're trying to fix teeth against teeth, basically what you have is Andrew six case to occlusion, where I think everybody pretty much knows this one through six. But let me ask you, if you have a symmetry, how about a skeletal symmetry? It still doesn't fix because your functional demands were actually not addressed. Dental symmetry, well, you get that corrected, yes, but functional movements, they're functional, but it's still working on a deflected position, which isn't helpful. It doesn't matter if you have a dental symmetry but have an erroneous functional movement. That's a bad orthodontic treatment. It, you can have, you can feature all these class ones, good interdigitations, no rotations at all, but have a functional, bad functional movement. That's not a good orthodontic treatment. So the jaws relate to one another through the muscles. What do I mean? The jaws should relate. Maximum relationship should relate with one another via the muscles, not via interarch elastics, especially when you're trying to treat interarch, uh, uh, I mean, asymmetries. The teeth is just where these jaws land. So what I'm trying to propose here is that you have to correct the position of the teeth so that it will bring your jaws to the rightful position. So Roth Williams was one of us, the students of Andrews, and he said that um, this six keys to occlusion is insufficient. So he came up with a new set, uh, and this is what the face philosophy um, or the face group uh, is following. So they have this pleasing facial aesthetics, good molar relationship and tooth alignment. That's basically all of this. And here's the key, functional occlusion that results in the functional movements. Functional occlusion in a sense, number one, balanced posterior contacts. If you have balanced posterior contacts, then you don't have premature contacts, you're gonna be able to eliminate any deviation. 
Next is canine guidance. Canine guidance would protect all your teeth as it removes laterally, you're gonna protect it. And finally, your anterior guidance, whereas you move your teeth, your lower jaw forward, then you're gonna have this good protection from your steering. And finally, the stability and prognosis of the teeth, muscle, bone, and joint. So I said intra-arch treatments would correct inter-arch relationships. Here, my hands are tied behind my back. As you can see, there's no more treatment going on in the upper. This patient is actually a retreatment, and he didn't want braces anymore. He just got his braces out about three months ago. But then his second molars start to erupt, and it's erupting in a third molar fashion where it's tilted forward. So I said, well, maybe we can treat it. And it's caused that premature contact, and it caused this bad symmetry. So how can I use the upper? I can't use the upper. I don't want to affect the upper, in fact. Patient doesn't want to affect the upper as well. So what I do is I use this tad and I use a spring to, to push this up and this is what happens. An intra-arch correction would lead to an inter-arch relationship. So by doing that, basically, what you're going to be able to do is not, is to, to uh, as you're fixing the teeth, you're also fixing the maxillary mandibular relationship. Uh, could, you, could you please go again that again? Um what spring? Where is the spring? Oh, I didn't include it. I just uh, put in the uh, the animations. Uh, uh, so you, you it, have it's, a spring? It's a custom made. It's a custom made spring, uh, which mm -hmm. just uh, causes the super eruption on the uh, third quadrant, primarily here on the premolar. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen the bending uh, in one of the other cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, clear. All right. So here's the, uh, the, the hypothesis that this uh, two kind of border movements can actually sh show us where these uh, deflective paths or deflected positions are. And it gives us a different perspective as how we should look at our cases. Should we look at our cases in the final position of the deflective path or in the start of the deflective path? Because that would change your treatment plans drastically. Uh, yeah, uh, Pao, before we move on, uh dr harris khan thank you for joining us uh dr somchai thank you and yeah uh dr ramesh has a question so in the lower arch for the asymmetry wherein you have utilized a tad on the lower right side how were you able to manage the buckle tipping of the lower posteriors while intruding them Buckle tipping lower posteriors while the yeah the last the last case one of the previous uh, yeah. cases uh, yeah the, the girl yeah yeah I, I think in that picture okay first of all that's not my case that was a case of my student um, but I, I think but obviously by the picture it wasn't controlled mm -hmm. uh, let me just go back to it it definitely wasn't controlled as you can see there's a buckle um, uh, a buckle crossbite developing over here mm -hmm. yeah but um, what would your possible way be to correct it? Uh, all right. So um, if I were going to treat this patient and control that buckle tipping, first of all, I would address the, uh, the leveling and alignment issue first. So I'm, I'm going to be more concerned about the level of the uh, occlusal planes, and I won't care about cross bites or buckle tipping, okay? As long as my teeth are still within the bone. But then, if I want to do it in like one step, but it's totally different. If you have symmetries like this, you have to hit it head on and you have to like uh, do certain scenarios like this where you have to intrude it first without thinking about the buckle torques and all of that because you're trying to eliminate that premature contact first and fix this asymmetry. But then if you're working on a, on a case where it's just dentally super erupted and you want to return it back to its position, a more controlled way to do it well, first of all, maybe a stiff one, I mean, the easiest way, but not a um, definite way, is to intrude it via um, a very stiff one, and then mm -hmm. you just have a counter moment um, bent there where you're lingually tipping it. But that doesn't guarantee anything as well. Mm -hmm. um, lingual holding which, arches, maybe. Which wire? Uh, which wire uh, have you intruded on? On a slot 22, uh, on a 1925. I see. Yeah, I would do the same. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably incorporate a little more uh, torque to get a control. Yeah. But I know these cases torque. are hard. It's it's very hard to especially uh, for the lower. Absolutely, it's it's going to be hard. 
Uh, let's take another question from Dr. Said. Why do you think the lower supra erupted and the mandible deviated? I mean, can you think of any probable etiology? Uh, is there any role for the tongue position or tongue tie with this particular patient? Now that we're going into to... etiologies, why do you think all this right. ever happened? The first all right. So um, when you lose your lower six, you have to understand that your mandible rotates downward and backward. And not usually, sometimes it's because of the upper six as it super erupts. But sometimes in this scenario, when you lose the lower six, it's the eight that actually erupts because there's some sagittal space, but there's no vertical space. So what it's going to do is it's going to erupt and it's going to push the lower jaw downward and backward. And now you have an anterior open bite in that scenario. And as you develop that anterior open bite, your jaws have no choice but to compensate and try to reach its opposing. In our very basic um, dental uh, uh, physiology, we know that our teeth would tend to find its opposing. Now, in this scenario, why would one side super erupt? Now, I would say that uh, this one super erupted because of this mechanics where you have these power chains over here. Ortho itself causes super eruption. Ortho itself causes super eruption. There's no, what I believe in, there's no natural intrusion. But then if you're using this mechanics where you're using this power chain, and according to the conical theory, right, our roots are conical, our, our uh, bones are conical as well. So as it levels in the lines and as it goes towards the other, it tends to super erupt towards um, the occlusal plane. So I think that because of that heavy forces on this side, that's basically, I think, what caused this. Okay, and uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Giorgio Fiorelli is watching as well. Wow. <laughs> sir. Okay, so you're going to have a lot of uh, mechanics questions now. Anyways, uh, oh, no. Dr. Prasad is asking, sir, what is the use of that long loop between the canine and the lateral incisor? Uh, that's, yeah. Was it this one? Which one? Hold on. The long loop, the closing loops, I suppose. Was it this one? Yeah. All right. So my principle is that when you're trying to consolidate your teeth, uh, as long as it's properly level aligned, what you should use is the thickest possible. Now this is a TMA wire, 1925, and you have to make it flexible. And this one, it, the length really has nothing to do with where I want the teeth to be, but rather it's, it's, it has more to do with how much uh, force generation I want. So a longer interbracket distance would give you a, uh, a better, more springier action and a more lighter forces here in the interior. So that's just uh, extra interbracket distance to give me more flexibility. Okay, so now I'm gonna consolidate some questions and just ask you in general, uh, Dr. Puri's, Dr. Ramakrishnan's questions. So can the condyla changes in functionally induced asymmetry revert back after functional correction? And yeah. why do you not use splints to deprogram in adult cases with a lateral shift from the very beginning? All right, uh, first question, yes, it can adopt. In the same way that malocclusions can cause some uh, some uh, anatomical changes, okay, functional. Uh, what what am I saying? In the same way that malocclusions or functional deviations could affect your anatomical deviations, it can also correct. Okay, your uh, if you put your teeth in the proper position, it can also correct your skeletal anatomy as long as you put it in the proper position. It's not going to be instant. Second question is, why do I not use splints? Now, honestly, I'm still trying to study the split, um, the split treatment. If you're going to look through books, split treatments are actually not treatments. They're diagnostic parameters. They reveal more about the position of the maxilla and the mandible. Don't, they don't treat malocclusions. You remove the symptoms. You determine where this RCP is, but you're not really correcting the situation yet. Now what you're supposed to do after splints is you're supposed to place, uh, after the splint, you're supposed to um, level a line with ortho, right? But so if you're gonna ask me, if I'm gonna use a splint and I correct the, the joints and I correct all the position, the maximum mandibular relationship, but then I remove the split 
and then I'm going to treat my patient orthodontically for about two, three months in situations where you have bad asymmetries like that girl before. Let me just go back to that one. If you're going to treat a patient with this much of an asymmetry, what's going to happen in this patient? You're going to be able to fix that maxillomandibular relationship, eliminate that asymmetry. But for that time being, from the start of your removal of the split to the point where you achieve uh, a position that is much more symmetrical, like in this situation, the intrusion of these teeth, there's about two, three, four, five months before you get this setting. So between that two, three, four, five months, what's happening to your conducts? I would suggest that it's going back to its old position where it's relapsing. So I would, like I said, I'm still trying to uh, convince myself that splits would be one way. But I would say that if you're going to change the occlusal topography with your splits, why not change your occlusal topography with your teeth? Right. Okay, and we can move forward. All right. So now let's go into the more interesting part where you have more cases. So this is the first case that I'd like to give to you. This is a botch up case. Um, a patient came in because she was really disappointed with her smile. We were able to see a very, very deep bite in this situation. Now, this is something that doesn't happen naturally. This is actually an iatrogenic botch up. Now, if we look over here, so I did like a digital mount or just simulation, as you can see, we mounted it on a semi-adjustable articulator and the orthodont, I mean, the prosthodontist basically told me that um, there's a certain direction that I have to put it. So he sent me this articulating, uh, this articulator and I decide on how I'm gonna approach the treatment. So we see the relationship of the teeth in this way. Now, the, the, the how can these uh, articulators help? It helps pretty much very well because it shows you where, objectively where you need to bring your teeth. So in such situation, Let's just look more into this, what happened to this patient. Her teeth, there's much anchorage that was lost over here. Two premolars have been extracted on one side. And it's obvious, I think, Dr. Edith, would you agree with me? Round wire was used with a continuous power chain to close these spaces. The roller coaster effect. <laughs> yep. All right. Now, the space wasn't enough, and she was losing a lot of anchorage in this case. If you look over here, this is ready for some grounds. I mean, this is... A uh, different level, god level of uh, of stripping. I mean, you still have those areas, no contact points established. This is, I, I don't know, this is botched up basically. <laughs> so let me show you how we approach this. So because of this mounting, we were able to see where we need to bring this teeth, and I brought it this way. And let me show you. In the simulation, this is how it is. It's a super eruption of this um, teeth not because of natural circumstances, but rather because of a natural occurrence, because of that retraction, this roller coaster effect. And as it did, it deflected the lower jaw towards this position. So how do I fix this lower jaw? Some would ask me, when would you even place the brackets on the lower? I mean, that's gonna be the least of my concerns. <laughs> For me, my concern is how am I gonna fix this asymmetry? So my decision is to intrude over there in the upper before, I can able to, before I'm able to fix the lower jaw so orientation with the upper. So here's the case, okay, and we're able to intrude it with differential placing of these power chain with these tads. Now, why could the tads not be placed distal to the laterals? I mean, distal to the centrals? Well, because I want a more retrusive action, retracting action. And once I got that space for the lower, that's when I place the brackets. And um, that's somewhere middle of my treatment this is uh, one of the latest. We're able to see that we now have a better relationship with the maxilla and the mandible. Do we have a question? No? Uh, no we just have some suggestions and uh, from uh, Dr. Ghani. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, she said that in the previous case, you could have used a splint for the first, uh, for and first bring the premolars in occlusal contact uh, before before you could have uh, identified and, and performed the treatment. Uh, that, that is that is definitely one of the options, and uh, the face philosophy exactly definitely. goes by that. Definitely, so it's 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 pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting that uh, uh, the use of semi-adjustable articulators and independent assessment of the maxillary and mandibular dentition per se is going to give you a very clear understanding of what movements are needed.
um, uh, in, a, in a very dynamic system in, in occlusion, it's, it's, it's going to be very hard to identify where the problem exactly exists. And maybe that is one, one of the reasons why, uh, why, why, why going on with that particular philosophy is, is great. Because you can independently assess exactly what is needed uh, and what kind of movement is needed to get into that uh, perfect occlusal plane. In addition to that, there must be some skill as to how this uh, independently, but how are they going to relate? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we should move forward. All right. So let me go to the next case. Now, I don't know about you guys, what you're going to do with this, but prosthodontists would look, yeah, you know, they, they might smile at this and definitely put in a split. But again, I said that, I mean, my own personal take is I don't like using splints. I'm still trying to convince myself to use them. But as you see, the way that I diagnose this patient is different. And it's not in this maximum intercuss patient situation. I diagnose this patient in the RCP position. Again, an independent take on both the upper and lower. So what does that tell me? That basically tells me, if you look at this pauses movement here on the right side of the screen, I have a mandibular deflection somewhere towards the right, and as shown here by the picture. And my investigation is that on the first tooth contact, it's actually canine to canine that's hitting. So here's where I want to prove my point. I'm using a TPA, as you can see, to establish my teeth because I don't have much teeth. I'm trying to address this asymmetry by correcting this canine here. And this canine here basically is what I'm trying to address. And as you can see, I have here a bypass wire, static determinate system. Something that uh, Dr. Georgia Ferrelli usually does, but I'm in a beginner mode. <laughs> but as you can see here, there's this um, torquing of this canine. And now I have this patient and she's more struggling with her bite because she's trying to buccalize over here, going back to that habitual position, but she's now hitting on this canine to canine relationship. So she can put this teeth, her jaw now left and right. But what you're seeing here is that the, uh, the lower is actually getting into better symmetry with the upper. And here's the next scenario. We're able to torque that, all right? You can torque this gently so you still have that bone around your teeth. And once you see it, you're going to see that your lower jaw now orients with your upper in a better situation. You've restored it to where it should be according to the apostle's movement. So. After that, a few treatments, right? A few adjustments. Now you put in your stay plate and you, now this is like my split therapy. So when you get this position here, you have to hold it into this position and wait some time. Why some time? Because you have to give some time for your, uh, your joints to remodel for about two to three months or four so that you can get or um, you remove this brackets already. So you can uh, continue on. So the patient can continue on with the treatment without any um, deviation. If we look at it from a facial perspective, we see that there's a slight deviation um, towards the right side. As you can see, the lip over here isn't showing as much. But after this treatment, we were able to fix that symmetry, give a more balanced feature in the better upper lip for this patient. That's a good change. Here again, you look at the frenum. Uh, it coincides with the midline. And basically, you have restored quality of life for this patient. Yeah, it's difficult, but then if, I don't know, how are you going to treat this patient without, without that philosophy? Extraction, extract everything <laughs> or something. Uh, for, for some, they won't even do anything. They're just going to play something aesthetic. But again, our function as dentists is to treat this patient not only aesthetically, but also functionally. We have to improve their lives. Could you just show us again, how do you raise the bite in this particular case, or do you just intrude? Ah, I don't raise bites. I just uh, buccalize that canine. That's all I did. So you had to intrude it first and then get it out? Nope. Yeah. How, how did this happen? All right, exactly the point. If you're going to diagnose this patient, statically and this lower jaw isn't moving then you're gonna think how on earth am i gonna bring that canine out now, as i said your jaw is moving mm -hmm. this occlusion happens at a very it's only a momentary situation within the human's jaw 
And it doesn't always happen. Right now, I think everybody who's listening is in a vertical rest position. Your teeth aren't even, aren't even hitting. When you talk, your teeth aren't even hitting. They're not supposed to hit. If they're hitting, then go get some orthodontic treatment. So for this patient, it's just the normal, simple buckle torque applied over here. No raising of bites. Uh, yeah, I get it. I get and I just let the premature contact happen there on the canine until I'm able to restore that position and see my asymmetry corrected naturally. So basically, basically you're working at night. Because at night, the patient's mouth is always in the rest position. It's open. I would say every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So can we move on? Yeah, sure. Next case. I think I have two more cases after this. All right, so let me just uh, go forward. Mm -hmm. All right. So here's the next case. AP photo showing us an asymmetry over here on the occlusal plane. And again, according to me, according to me, I would say that this is not a real asymmetry. A real asymmetry would be reserved. If you're going to ask me, reserved for those patients who have craniofacial problems, craniofacial deformities. For this patient, it's a deviation. It's a mandibular deflection. But the question is, why is it deflected? So we saw a little bit of premature contact on the right side, but then my idea, because this patient was also diagnosed in a class three position, if I supra erupt this side rather than intrude this side, then I'm going to be able to rotate my jaw downward towards the center and also downward and backward. So let me show you how it's going to be done in a short moment. Okay, here's the teeth. Maximum intercuspation. This is the static way that we would uh, review our cases. This is the normal, and this is my reading on this patient. It's this bad. So from the sagittal perspective, we have the lower teeth actually in a protrusive. This is their maximum intercuspation. It's in the protrusive position. However, this is uh, not in the deflected position. The deflected position is over here where it's shifted towards the right side. So in this situation, what I want to show you is that again, uh, this is a class three situation. So I extracted the premolar, right? Why on earth will I extract that premolar? If I'm diagnosing my patients on this perspective of maximum intercuspation, this will screw up my whole life. That canine will fall into a class two. But because I didn't diagnose it in this way, all right? Oh, there you go. I told you so it's going to go into a class two. But well, hold on, I said I'm going to super erupt this uh, second quadrant here by this simple spring. And you can do your springs this way, um, pretty much anyway. Uh, Dr. Adit loves to uh, put an implant on the opposing arc and then pull the opposing teeth, right, for super eruption. Yeah. Uh, I do it this way. And as I super erupt that second quadrant, here's the interesting part. So we get to see the jaw going into an edge to edge and slightly fixing this asymmetry. Did I just lose anchorage? Absolutely not. As shown here in this picture here, we have established that this patient was in maximum uh, anchorage, bringing that canine back to where it was intended to be, if we diagnose it in this way. But here's another development as we super erupted that side more, okay? Now we have a class one canine relationship with the maxilla and the mandible relating with one another in a better situation. Here's the difference. Now, just after the space consultation on this area, then we're gonna be able to fix that a little bit more and a little bit more super eruption there, then we're gonna be able to address it. But we see that in this uh, simple case, simple <laughs> that in this uh single case that there is a huge discrepancy in terms of what your diagnosis is versus what your treatment plan will be in two separate positions that's why i said that you might get in trouble if you're going to diagnose your patients in a uh, in a maximum intercuspation situation my suggestion is we have to diagnose this patient according to that first tooth contact Okay. Any questions? Wow. 
uh, okay, this this is something that I would never even dream of doing, but because I mean it's 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 so difficult to anticipate that you're gonna get that forward movement and you're gonna be able to correct that amount of uh, a, a class two uh, to a class one by just extruding the uh, the posteriors on the left side. So it's it's yeah. Uh, I, I do understand the rationale behind it, but it's 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 pretty difficult to anticipate uh, movements of these kind. Yeah, definitely. So, so we we have a question. Uh, we have a question. Yeah, uh, doctor, do you by doctor Ajma Aisha Ali, doctor, do you think that correction of the canine in cross bite in the patient with missing anteriors would have been faster had you used bite blocks? What's the first question again? Do you think that correction of the canine and cross bite uh, in the patient with the missing anteriors, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Would it be would it have been faster if you had used bite blocks? Ah, okay. Ah, right. Um, first thing I want to address is uh, faster. Doctor added, you know that I'm a guy who is in no rush in any way. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, for me, I, I make it a point with my patients. And it's different from culture to culture and even from uh, social status. It's different per patient. Some patients are in a rush and some patients, they, they, they're just much more chill. Now, I'm more on the chill side. So um, making it faster, not necessarily. But here's the thing that I have with bite blocks. And this could be another uh, session. But if you're going to ask me, First, I established that your RCP or first tooth contact or your RCP or your CR are also called calls or interferences or premature contact. When you put bite blocks, this is actually a treatment plan. This is, for, this is my personal opinion. When you put in bite blocks, this is a treatment for the dentist. This is intended, this, this modality is, it is done in order to make the dentist's life much more easier. If you're going to ask your patient, they would not love bite blocks. Why? Because bite blocks, again, is another premature contact. It's another premature contact where this patient could hit and, not, again, develop another kind of a symmetry. I don't really use bite blocks. I don't think it would make it faster. Again, my argument is this. You only bite when you're, okay, this maximum intercourse patient, you only get this when you're chewing your food, when you're clenching. But you're not clenching throughout the day. Dr. Adams said all through the night, you're not clenching your teeth if you're not a brookser. Right now you're listening to me when you're talking, when you're breathing, you're usually in your vertical rest position. I don't know about you, but I have no contacts. In normal situations, there's no contact in a normal situation unless you eat. So that's why I don't use bite box. I want my teeth to move in their own personal space, regardless of what the contact is with the lower. It doesn't make things faster. I think it could relieve, it could like open the gateway, but I don't think that it's going to be a treatment that is conducive for my patient. Uh, okay, so Dr. Gupta is asking, Dr. Sani Gupta, welcome. What's Hi, your Dr. opinion Sunny. about the condyla position on extrusion side? Extrusion side? This side. I mean, in this particular case, you said that you've extruded the upper left. Ah, so what do you right. think? What do you think has happened to the ah, Okay. So again, uh, this position, this patient was diagnosed in a class three position. This patient is a full blown class three, except that the records would show you that it's not a class three because it's deviated. The jaw is actually deflected. So super erupting that, uh, that left side. Okay. Super erupt erupting that left side would basically mimic the same thing that's going on in the right side. So I think it's going to be fine mm -hmm. as long as you do it slowly, as long as you do it slowly. Okay. So uh, Dr. Li Hang Sheng has a question. For the last case, the upper incisor proclined quite a bit. Does it affect the incisor show while smiling? As you can see in this particular slide, I see that the uh, U1SN has you. probably increased quite a bit. Hello. Can uh, you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, the U1SN yeah. on this particular case may have increased quite a bit. What's your plan for this particular case? How are you going to uh, uh, correct the proclination? Of course, I'm going to retract it um, mm. after after I uh, fix this uh, asymmetry. Okay. 
Uh, another uh, symmetries are part of leveling in the life stage. So uh, we can't expect that, you know, things are, I'm, I'm talking in the spectrum of leveling alignment, talking in the spectrum of uh, symmetries. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you just have one more case. So I'm going to be going very elaborately in, 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 with the questions uh, so that we can answer all of them. Um, now, would you consider the presence of erupting third molars and posterior discrepancy and based, based your diagnosis at the RCP before deciding on a lower premolar extraction? Again, this patient, okay. First of all, yes, third molars are, are, are the culprit for, uh, for, especially in class three. Um, they're usually the culprits for asymmetries. Third molars are usually the culprits for um, asymmetries. But again, this patient was diagnosed in the class three position. This patient was diagnosed in the class three position. That's why I went away with extracting the premolar because I know and I'm confident that when I fix the Uzo plane and put it where I want it to be or where I need it to be, I'm going to be able to get this class one relationship. If I don't extract that premolar and I just super up this uh, left side, I'm going to get a full blown class three. Let me clarify this again. You have diagnosed this case on a class three. By that, you mean that when the first point contact was in class three. First is that contact. what you mean to say? Yeah, first tooth first contact, is contact is in was three. in a class three. So that's yeah. how you diagnose this particular case as a class three. Yes. Okay, so that's a very different kind of a thought process altogether because that's, that's uh, something that people have possibly, uh, they, we're not following that. But yeah, it's a very interesting take, and, and I do understand the concepts behind it, considering the functional occlusion part of it. Okay, so Dr. Ramakrishnan has another question. How would you set the limit of the lateral shift, which can be corrected by orthodontics alone? How do you know that this is okay to be corrected with orthodontics, and this is just too much? What is the diet? Right. I have no guide. <laughs> uh, I, I'm uh, right. If your malocclusion could have done it, then I think orthodontics could also fix it. So you really need to be sure what the etiology was in order to yes. make a story out of it and then yep. correct it. So yep. that's basically how it boils down to. You need yep. to know if, what caused it. If this, how it if this was a surgical, if this was a surgical asymmetry case, right? And it's something that's not caused by dental situation, but rather caused by a craniofacial um, problem or deformity. For that kind of case, that, that's absolutely surgical. There's, there's no way that you can fix it because by growth itself from the, from the point that that patient was a child to the point that this patient was a or an adult, you have that asymmetry going up. So you have to intervene into giving more structure to where it's needed to be added or reduce any structure to where it needs to be reduced. But in a certain symmetry where it's dentally cost, to a skeletal asymmetry that it's dentally cost, I believe that if you fix it dentally, you can also affect your skeletal. As I argued before with uh, those uh, papers that I showed, that you can remodel your mandible, you can remodel your cape condyle, you can remodel your ramus, as long as you fix or you change the functional demands of your occlusion. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, you have a question. Can you show us the spring that you fabricated for the extrusion? Yeah, even I want to see that. That's pretty fascinating. For this one? Uh, yeah, you, you, you made a spring, right, to extrude your uh, left side. So that's could, a very just, could you just run us through uh, what is the what is the mechanics behind it and what is the active component? Uh, uh, I apologize that I wasn't able to uh, uh, show that right, but this one basically is uh, it's bent this way, where it's. Could you please uh, zoom in? Could you please zoom in on that? Let me just. Okay. Mm, now it makes sense. Okay. <laughs> so this one, uh, the legs are actually open 
and in an inactive uh, position. This uh, spring is somewhere located here. And in order for me to super air up, I engage it on the wire. First, I, uh, this one is not engaged yet. And once I get all the wire engaged into the brackets, that's when I engage this uh, component over here into the eye of the, uh, uh, of the implant. So it, um, you, can, you can put it in certain areas. So over here, as you see, I put it on the bracket area. So uh, what kind of wire would you work on while doing this? Well, definitely a rectangular wire. Um, the least could be 1622. Um, I think the best would be 1725 because it's a little weak and a little mm -hmm. bit strong. Mechanically, so, and, uh, I you have. You know, yeah. Mechanically, I feel this would give you a little bit of a buckle of torque as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Dr. Dr. Emra has this question. I think the problem is functional, but treatment is dental, isn't it? You should expand the maxilla. Could you please explain that? Uh -huh. All right. So for this uh, expand the maxilla, all right. I don't have a space problem in the upper. Why am I going to expand the upper? I don't have to expand the upper. So uh, in my sense is that I'm thinking more about the asymmetry on the lower jaw. And if this were something that could have been because of the upper, and as you can see, there's no problem with the upper. The upper is already pretty much level in line. I, in fact, I expanded on this part over here, but then it didn't give any um, fixation for the lower. What was needed over here was rather a vertical component rather than a transverse component to fix this, um, this asymmetry. I would say that for those crossbites or uh, maybe unilateral crossbites, uh, this one wasn't a unilateral crossbite. As you can see in the anteriors, you have full blown class three. It's shifted all the way to the right. This is this is this is not something that you usually see. This is uh, this is one sided. So you also have to approach it in a different way. If you do an expansion, you can house the lower, but then I, I don't think that will be enough. But then you would need a skeletal expansion in this particular case because I already see that the teeth are buckly inclined from the very beginning. Yeah. And yeah. uh, and and just a regular expander would just create a more create more ruckus to the situation. It, well, again, there's no space problem. If you absolutely. expand here, then you get more spaces. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but but these days there are a lot of these treatment modalities going on. I mean, people just uh, out of the blue diagnose a transverse discrepancy when there is none, uh, especially no. because of the airway uh, thing going on uh, yeah. these days. Uh, and uh, Dr. Methar, yeah, Dr. Methar, uh, he has he has a very similar question. I mean, I was I was probably going to just point this out as well. If the teeth had erupted far beyond the freeway space itself, uh, would you would you still uh, consider a bite block? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, even if uh, even if there is a vertical uh, freeway space and the bite bite is still blocked, um, and that's a pretty big uh, cross bite. That's a big bite block. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a big bite block. I mean, I, I usually go in for such things when when there's a scissor bite, because a scissor bite yeah. uh, is is a very difficult thing to uh, correct. You need those uh, sing, single sided <laughs> huge bite blocks. I mean, because there's no other way I could I could, I can go around those. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think if I'm going to use bite blocks, that's the only time that I'll use bite blocks. Uh, do you rely on dental history of the patient to be certain that the etiology is functional or uh, or it just depends on your workflow. Um, all right. The nice thing about this postal's border movement is that, uh, okay, I'm not downplaying the importance of history. You need history. But the nice thing about postal's is that you have a basis. You have a basic that you have to follow. There's a natural movement that everybody should have. But then if you see it deflected, then now you have to investigate. Again, you have a normal position. If you diagnose this patient, this is an abnormal position, right? But again, in the RCP or the first tooth contact position, you get a normal position, something that will be easier to treat. So, um, what was the question again? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, would you would you uh, base uh, your dental history? Or... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would definitely. Uh, yeah. So I'll I'll just use my. Okay, definitely history is one. Definitely you're gonna need that. But your, your apostles movements also tells a lot about history. Mm -hmm. Tells a lot about history. Again, when you're growing, 
your pulse's movement is normal until a certain point, and that's when you totally lose it. Yeah, uh, Dr. Wentan is asking, have you ever tried using a yin yang notch wire uh, to treat an asymmetry? I don't even know what that is. A uh, yin yang notch wire is, is, is it's like a curve speed with different curves. One is going down, one is going up. I, I've heard people use uh, that no, for no. Uh, uh, occlusal cans. So they're, uh, they're like two different reverse curves in both sides. So one goes yeah, up and yeah. one goes down. Okay. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't use that. Um, and even if I uh, did, uh, the thing with cats is that there is a, uh, the important thing with cats is that you have to establish what your anchorage is. And in cats, there is de a definite need for tats. There is no way that you can do wire therapy. You can do wire therapy. You can straighten out the teeth according to each other. You can change the bracket position, but still that's teeth to teeth. Teeth to bone is where it matters when it comes to occlusal cats. So a definite need for tats would be the better way Absolutely. rather than going through a relative way through your wires. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dr. Manas is asking, where, where are there any TMJ issues pre and post treatment as uh, there was a significant amount of asymmetry initially? So how, how does the condyle and how does the glenoid fossa actually adapt to such a huge change uh, that, that takes right. place in this year? If you show a picture like this, you're gonna see that there's a huge change per se, but you have to understand that as you're doing your orthodontic treatment, there's a consistent bone remodeling that happens. And that's the pressure intention sites, not only in the alveolar bone, but also in those insertion origins of your facial muscles, your muscles of expression, facial expressions, in the muscles of mastication as well, and also along the, uh, the ligaments that are surrounding your temporomandibular joint, there's also pressure and tension over there. So these pressure and tensions that's happening all around the mouth, this is what it's gonna, um, this is what's gonna change the shape of your condyles. It doesn't happen instantly. Pictures, you see, oh, that's a huge jump. But when you think about it in actual or real time, you actually have enough time for the bone to remodel according to the functional demands that you subject it to. So you're going to be fine. So Dr. Sai Gupta has this thing. Uh, uh, he's saying that if the screw is used to extrude the segment along with the spring, as you've done in the case, may as well could have placed a screw in the lower uh, and uh, you could have possibly use elastics to extrude the upper posterior segment. Kindly share your opinion on what uh, advantage the spring would have had compared to a tad in the lower with elastics. Uh, now the tad with lower elastics will be a doctor added treatment. <laughs> okay, so if you put the tad on the lower arch, what kind of elastic would you use, doctor added? Would you use a 3-4, a 1-4, 1-8, I mean, if it's a stiff wire, I would definitely go in for uh, a three by 16 medium or a one by eight. I mean, if, if I want to be aggressive. Yeah. Uh, and, and here's the thing is that if you're going to place a tad on the lower arch and in an asymmetric case, you put an inter arch elastics. What's going to happen here is that there's still the, uh, your load bearing area in that situation where you're trying to super up the upper teeth would be in the condylar area or along the ramus. So that's not gonna be good for an asymmetry. That's not gonna be good for an asymmetry. So as I said uh, a few slides before, is that in order for you to correct this inter-arch relationships, you require, it requires a, a, an intra-arch treatment. Uh, just uh, another follow-up question by Dr. Vishal said, is that, uh, uh, up to what extent would you consider using into arch elastics uh, in asymmetry cases? Uh, I think um, you've answered this question, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a reciprocal movement, isn't it? The yeah. more you use into arch elastics, the more you're screwing up the other part. Exactly. Yeah, so you want to just stick to the problem and you want to correct yeah. that uh, independently rather than involving okay. the other segment. Now, let me answer this first mechanically. Um, according to the book, if I'm not mistaken, you're allowed to use your elastics for three millimeter um, um, differences. So that would be healthy. More than three millimeters is not going to be good. Now, in certain scenarios, which is a whole scenario for normal scenarios, so 
there's asymmetric cases. Like I said, you have to allow your muscles to fix or to return that jaw, that maxillomandibular relationship back to one another, back to one another in order for you to fix the functional demands. If you don't give that functional demands for your muscles, then you don't get to correct it. If you give it more towards the elastics, then you're gonna fix it dentally again. You're gonna get this teeth, um, six keys to Andrew's occlusion, all um, checked. But then you might still have an asymmetry, which is still not uh, productive for an asymmetric case. That's, that's actually pretty much what I do. Uh, because I, I still have these cases of uh, asymmetries and uh, when, when they open their mouth, uh, I see that the midlines are coincidence and that, that's how basically I diagnose a functional uh, shift. Uh, so I, I go in for those uh, midline elastics with those class three elastics with those white turbos at the back in order to uh, uh, gain a good occlusion. I'm, I'm, I'm able to get a good occlusion towards the end, but as I mentioned, the skeletal asymmetry is something that I'm not able to correct 100%, maybe 60%, but not 100%. So I think I'm going to revisit that kind of a treatment planning and probably attack the cause more than anything else. Yeah. So yeah, we can continue. All right. So for the final case, um, this is a wonderful case. As you can see over here, there's a bad asymmetry and the jaw is going towards the left. And as you can see, the alveolar bone is uh, outlined here by the blue line. The midlines are here on the green line. And we see this pattern of uh, position of these teeth here in the posterior. And when we look intra-arch, upper is symmetric, lower is also symmetric. So in a situation like this, if the lower is symmetric intra-arch and the upper is symmetric intra-arch, let's not bother the upper. Lower is intra-arch symmetric. If I extract this premolar here, I'm able to bring my canine here, get a class one canine over there, have a class one canine over here. Basically that fixes my problem according to the six keys to occlusion. But then if I extract that and I retract that, then I affect this arch symmetry that we have here. And that's bad for the jaw, why? You can get your teeth into a good relationship. But then what matters more in your stability, what matters more in the quality of life, what matters more in the function is actually the symmetry, the proper function of your upper and lower jaw meeting with one another. So for me, this is definitely not an option. If we look at this scenario, I mean, in this perspective, we see that this side is upright and this one is lingualized. For normal orthodontists, I mean, um, if, uh, that's not what I mean. If you're just going to look this, look at this, the knee-jerk reaction for a treat for a situation like this would be to upright this side. But actually, it's happening. Uh, the situation here is you have to know what's actually going on over here. And here's the real scenario: it's actually this right side is super erupted. And it's the one that's wrong, but it's the one that looks correct over here. And this lower, this left, I mean, this left side is the one that is correct. It's just being deflected. And this is happening all around this growth period of this patient. This patient is about 14 years old and their third molars are actively erupting. And those are the worst cases, right? So let me just go through this. And as you can see, there is a pattern of growth over here. And they're all initialized and also super erupted compared to the occlusal plane in the, in the anterior. They're super erupted in this posterior. Now, I can go about use multiple edgewise arch work. That would correct the, uh, the, that could correct the occlusal plane, but then I would argue again with the symmetry of the intra arch if I fix the occlusal plane through the multiple edgewise arch work. So this patient actually had a third molar pushing out in this area here. So what I determined the cause for this patient is the third molar super eruption, and it caused the super eruption and initial tilting on these teeth. So that's where my strategy would be. If you look here, this patient is actually asymmetric this way. And if we put it in this perspective, then we see the asymmetry happening. Cut the photo in half, flip it over, and see that you have two different faces, which basically confirms that you have an asymmetry and a whole a big a significant difference from your left towards your right side. Wow. So this is what you're supposed to do. I mean, I mean, this is what happened. So the third molar is developing. 
it's erupting uh, actively and it causes this super eruption over here. So this super eruption causes an open bite over here, but you see that there's no open bite or not much of an open bite as shown in the photo. But then this is what happened. It's because this, uh, our jaws are supposed to be third class levers, but because of the super eruption here, it became a second class lever. So now that second class, as it rotates the jaw upward and forward here on the anterior portion, this one removes my condyle out of the articular fossa, it pulls it out of the articular fossa. And what's, you have to understand what's going on over here is that there's a lot of ligaments, your temporal mandibular joint ligaments that are stretching over here, causing a lot of tension. Therefore, causing, uh, you have now a new functional requirement giving you a new um, uh, anatomy towards that side, thereby causing this malocclusion that we see in this patient. So this patient was actually being treated previously uh, on orthodontics, but my, um, my skills were called into that clinic uh, because they, they uh, couldn't seem to find a solution for this patient. So this is uh, my first treatment. I put in the brackets. I'm gonna develop first the upper in order for me to expose my lower and to see where it's actually moving. So my treatment plan is to reverse the effects that actually happened, to reverse the effects of the third molar. So intrude it, and as I intrude it, I allow my jaw to relate again with one another the proper way. So here it is, all right? And here's the initial fix. I placed a, a, a buckle shelf implant, and then I use here, right? I place in there an auxiliary wire with a hook that is uh, trying to, uh, I'm trying to change. First of all, I'm giving an attachment for my, uh, my elastics. And also I'm trying to attack the line of action in a better way. So this hook is basically uh, going this way out of the auxiliary tube up and just a hook, just that simple, out of the auxiliary tube and hook. And as you can see, oh, sorry, let me just go back. Here in this patient, all right, so I love to take these photos as well. I take these photos, and these are the, uh, uh, either the vertical rest position or the, uh, uh, the first tooth contact pictures. Um, but these are not first tooth contact pictures. These are uh, freeway space, I mean, vertical rest position. And as you can see over here, there's a, there's a point in time for this patient that the midlines are actually coinciding. Again, the lower, is intra-arch symmetric. And as you can see, the relationship here is supposed to be correct. But upon maximum intercuspation, you get a deflected position and it goes back to where it is. So here's the development. Now there's a whole different issue to the canine bracket positioning over here versus the premolars. But as you can see, the position where you have an open bite and I'm not doing anything on this side, right? I get the contact over there, not doing anything over there. All right, from the front position, you're seeing the mandible going back slowly towards the right side. You're seeing this midline. It's somehow staying in the same position, but there's a space passively developing in this area. Okay. And this is where it's interesting. So I intrude and retract. Intrude in the track in a more in a, in this uh, um, line of action fashion. And as you can see, look at the canine relationship: initial to the canine, end on, slightly distal, and it's about to go into a class one. Give me a few more months. Uh, molars, right there directly below the premolar. Initial contact points are now parallel. And now this one is a little bit more distalized. And here's where it's interesting. As you eliminate that contact, look at the asymmetry of the patient's face and how we were able to give a good symmetry back on to this patient's face just by doing it. Now, it's very easy for this case because this patient is still growing and she's, we, we were able to treat it at the, at the right point in time. That's why to, in order for you to correct this one, it's quite easy. Um, in terms of, uh, of the remodeling that should happen in this picture. So before I go conclude, uh, do we have any question? 
or should I conclude it first? Uh, yeah, you could conclude it first. Then I have a, I have a set of questions myself. All right. So asymmetries in the dental malocclusions are highly linked with each other. The dental border movements reveal the differences in the proper mandibular relationship. They differ per individual. They differ per individual, but they are highly um, replicable in the or reproducible in the same individual. And finally, as orthodontists, the skills in determining the physiological position, the normal position, and the deflected position could give an alternative perspective to a static approach. That's it. Okay, so uh, Dr. Pao, now I would uh, I would like to add some uh, questions by uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Vini. Yeah, thank you for joining us, Dr. Vini. Uh, he's asking you how do you treat cases of unilateral complete cross bites with extrusion of upper and lower posteriors? Uh, if it's extrusion of the upper posteriors, then you have to intrude it. But that's two, um, two dimensions to it. One is you have a vertical, and the other one is you have a transverse problem. So mm -hmm. leveling alignment comes before, um, uh, sorry, leveling comes before alignment. Alignment addresses the transverse. Leveling addresses the vertical. So you have to fix first the vertical, see if there's a new relationship. After that, if it's still not corrected, then you go on to constriction. So uh, I would like to add, I mean, if, if, if you're possibly talking about a scissor bite, Dr. Vineet, uh, I, would, uh, I, would, I, would like I would like to add that uh, a scissor bite is a whole different story and uh, uh, mostly unilateral, of course, and, and, and you'll have to raise the bite a lot on one side. Uh, I, I prefer using buckle shelf implants. I just see them in the uppers, including the lowers. And finally, when I get some amount of uh, no contact zone, is when I would I would start using cross bite elastics along with the intrusive vector simultaneously to just get the contacts on. Uh, that's how I correct a scissor bite. Some cases I just expand the lowers by using uh, a Schwartz appliance, uh, which would just upright the the, the posterior segment because the Schwartz appliance also has uh, a posterior bite block. So that helps with both. Uh, the next is, uh, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Drogana is asking, what program do you use for such simulations? You know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Would you, would you want to explain that to us? Keynote and a lot of time. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so he uses Keynote for all these uh, simulations. Uh, he can, you can private message him possibly. Uh, that's his trade secret, I suppose. He doesn't want to let that out. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Mojuan really. Chu. Hi, would you consider extractions for a patient with congenital missing upper one, upper one upper lateral incisor, but the facial arch does not require extractions? Of course not. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Ranjit Ramakrishnan, since the third molar pressure is the cause, isn't it necessary to remove the third molars first and then start orthodontics? Absolutely. I just didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, what I presume is that if, if, if everything is okay and you have a third molar, you would rather get it out, isn't it? But yes. then if the problem has already uh, been caused by the eruption of the third molar, uh, you might as well get it out, but the problem is already there. So now you have to yeah. treat it. But in either either situations, getting the third molar out is uh, is is a is a very good option, isn't it? It's the best option. Okay, fine. Uh, I so, would blame the third molars for about uh, a majority of the asymmetry uh, cases. Absolutely. So that's that's something that I would take away. I mean, uh, I I would, I would start extracting those third molars in most of these uh, asymmetry cases, considering that if, they, that was that was that was the etiology. Uh, depending. If my patients don't want me, if I see that there's an asymmetry and the patient doesn't want the third molars out, mm -hmm. I, I'll tell them, I'm sorry, I can't treat you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to read those. Yeah, well, he's like, uh, Dr. Vinita has a follow-up question, sir. Uh, will you use cross elastics even through your posterior, even though your posteriors are extruded? No. Okay. Yeah, as we mentioned, Dr. Vineet, uh, the treatment modality, modality for a scissor bite is absolutely different. And I, I think I've explained that as well. So now let me, let me just go, uh, go on my questions. And after that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, 
read those thank you messages uh so yeah uh my uh, first of uh, these are these are just points and uh, conclusion remarks that i i possibly got out of your lecture first is to diagnose this particular case uh, uh, diagnose every case uh, on a first tooth contact basis and not the yeah. maximum intercuspation because that is just a timely affair uh, in which the patient is for just the purpose of chewing and occasionally while speaking am i right yeah okay second takeaway is that uh, you do not need to use bite blocks for uh, mild cross bite cases because you always have a free waste space in which the patient yeah. is considering about 23 hours a day yeah. to solve most of the issues including yeah. cases of anterior cross bite locked lateral incisors i would assume as well isn't it yeah yeah okay third is it is very very important to diagnose a case individually as maxilla separate mandible separate uh by possibly the use of an articulator to identify what exactly is the problem is the right side extruded or the left side extruded or intruded per se and then act on that particular segment alone yes. rather than jeopardizing the entire occlusion with the use of elastics and reciprocal anchorage yes okay fourth is stability is paramount especially in these asymmetric cases if you just look at the teeth or the heart tissue paradigm of it if you don't address the main root etiology and take just the heart tissue or the middle lines you bound to relapse yes uh and yes uh yep so so these are the things that uh, and 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 uh, the last case was amazing especially the case in which you got the canine out uh, using those uh, torquing auxiliaries uh, uh excellent excellent lecture um uh, i i really appreciate your thinking over here because uh, i may be very good at moving teeth but now i realize that i'm 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 a really stupid person in diagnosing a case in the first uh, first uh, go uh, you i i really have to possibly look at things differently look at the whole story uh, now i now i understand the relevance of looking at an opg per se uh, if if i see a a, a missing uh, first molar i know that the second molar has mesially tipped and possibly has uh, Uh, extruded distally causing some amount of asymmetry some amount of mandibular shift uh so i'm i'm going to look at it differently now the last thing I, i totally forgot about i i i i i just overlooked it uh this this thing that you spoke about the auto rotation uh following intrusion of the molars i would like to clarify uh do you see auto rotation of the mandible in a counter clockwise direction in all the cases of molar intrusion or in very certain cases of molar intrusion all right if you do it correctly you're supposed to see some auto rotation if you're that's that's what you're anticipating and that that if that's what you're anticipating then your approach no, my, should be correct no my 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 question is my question is if the occlusion is absolutely fine if there is no first ah. tooth contact yeah would you would you still recommend intrusion of the molars to generate a counter clockwise rotation for bettering the profile per se do you understand my concept yeah 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 okay. uh i would, would say that i would want... that even happen uh i think that okay when you're intruding or okay whatever it is if you're going to affect your lower jaw in a counter clockwise movement or a clockwise movement for for profile or aesthetic purposes Um I think there should, there could be a different approach to this and that's basically a whole arch uprighting versus a, a single tooth upright. Um if you change the whole position of your whole occlusal plane by perhaps using multiple edgewise arch wires then I think that that could be an option. But um and you're basically going to change your occlusal plane from something like this to something like this or so. But then if you're going to change it uh unintentionally 
Right. I'm going to change it just for super eruption correction to screw up your uh, your relationship with the lower. I don't think I would recommend that. Uh, a very interesting point by Justin Arnold, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, the Rinchus brothers, I'm not very sure, he's, he's excellent with his evidence though. Uh, in their book, Evidence-Based Clinical Orthodontics, talk about three mole, third molars not guilty in terms of causing lower anterior crowding. What is your opinion about that? I would say uh, let common sense kick in. Um, your second molars and your first molars are suspended by your periodontal ligaments. Your third molar is also suspended by your third uh, by your periodontal ligaments, but the difference is that the third molars have your um, supra or their their eruption force, their eruption force. And when it's time for the third molars to come out, they're going to come out and destroy anything in its way. So sometimes the second molar, and I think we have seen that. That there are some caries developing on the cervical part of your second molar when the third molars are erupting. And it's and you see that it's not only a caries, but you also see the third molar growing into that second molar. Right? Now, in the same way, there are some cases that don't have caries, but these third molars still grow into it and they thereby push your second your second molar. With the with your third, I mean with your periodontal ligaments. If especially that your occlusal plane is still developing and your third molars are coming up, I don't think your second molars have uh, stand a chance in terms of keeping that stable. But if your arches are already stable and you have an excellent occlusion and your third molars are over there, I think your, your good occlusion, your functional requirements could constantly reject that third molar. Imagine uh, 28 teeth against four teeth. I think that would work out, but that's pretty much rare. I would say that still your third molars could affect it. Again, uh, we mentioned a while ago that there's a lot of debate about it. My personal take is that your teeth is suspended by periodontal ligaments. They would move anywhere where they are moved, where, where they are pushed. And I would say that your third molars would definitely affect. Uh, I have an interesting take on that. Uh, this was actually supposed to be my PhD dissertation before what I did. Uh, the effect of third molars basically on late mandibular growth. So uh, after a lot of research, I, I got into this conclusion that, you see, when the third molars actually don't have a direct role in causing anterior crowding, but what happens is uh, the late mandibular growth phase is such, right? When the third molars erupt, it's, it's nothing to do there. The reason for anterior, ant, uh, anterior crowding is the late mandibular growth. You see that the upper and lower incisors are placed like this, right? And as and when, because I myself have it, I mean, I, I have a good occlusion, but I, I, I do see, I, I have seen some amount of anterior crowding. So what happens is when the mandibular, when the mandible grows uh, towards the late mandibular growth phase, it hits against the upper incisors and then it has no particular space to go. And, and, and finally, it causes some amount of anterior crowding. There is a lot of evidence on this that actually it's the late mandibular growth that's the culprit for anterior crowding, which is simultaneous with the eruption of the third molar. You know what I'm saying, yeah. right? That, that's the same time that the third molars are erupting. So there is a misconception that it's the third molar that's actually causing the anterior crowding, whereas it's the late mandibular growth that's associated with it that is actually causing the anterior crowding. I would, I would have, uh, let me just add to it. Uh, I think we're on common ground in a sense that our context is kind of different. For your third molars to affect your anteriors, I don't think that it would affect your, your the crowding of the, the anteriors. But crowding doesn't only happen in the sagittal perspective. Crowding also happens in the vertical perspective. Vertical perspective in a sense that it tends to super erupt. So in, in the context of asymmetries, when your third molars erupt and they push out the second molars as well, I think that's where your asymmetries can be found because of the third molars. But as far as your uh, anterior crowdings are concerned, I think I'll, I'll take your same take that it's not gonna be the third molars that are the cause. I have a crowded uh, anterior as well as shown in the uh, few slides in the middle part and that was basically caused because of my mandibular shift going towards the right side. And that right side shift